Learn more about turning your business vision into reality, visit SignatureBank.Bank. Signature Bank, helping local businesses succeed. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. It is 808. Let's get an update on the roads in the AM560 Traffic Center with Jim. The travel time has risen on the inbound candidate to 27 minutes. So here to downtown, it's heavy Harlem to Central. And from before the Hubbard Tunnel to the Burns Circle, it is quicker in the express lanes than in the locals. And outbound, it's now 23 minutes downtown to the airport. The inbound Eisenhower is gummed up from Mannheim to 17th with a crash in the left lane. 39 minutes, 390 to downtown, outbound 30. On the Stevenson, it's 32 minutes from the Veterans Memorial Tollway to Lakeshore Drive. The Maya, 24 minutes, 95th to downtown. I-57, 16 minutes, I-80 to the Verge, Bishop Fort 13. Lakeshore Drive, 24 minutes either way between Hollywood and Marquette. That's traffic. I'm Jim Helamonte. On AM560, The Answer. Worried about basement flooding? Time to call Permaseal, 800-421-SCAL. Chicago's Morning Answer continues next. In our AM560 Weather Center, cloudy, breezy, and then according to an inch of snow begins the uh, snowfall late this afternoon, just in time for the rush, high 34, and then the heavy snow overnight, 3 to 6 inches possible with a low of 31. It's 29 right now. Your next news update is at 8.30. Continuous news coverage at 560theanswer.com. Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues next. On AM560, The Answer. From the Matrix Home Solutions Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer. On AM560, The Answer. Listen to AM560, The Answer, online at 560theanswer.com, on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, on TuneIn, iHeart, and Radio.com. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. So Dr. Deborah Burke sat down with Margaret Brennan, uh, F.A.S. The Nation, yesterday for a extended interview and the uh, parts that uh, the D.C. press corps pick out to amplify are not the most interesting parts. And point of fact, I think the most interesting tell from Deborah Burks's Q&A was uh, this little bit from uh, talking about how things uh, developed from March and April, the, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve to the lockdowns that started and then the over the summer, some of the states starting to break with the orthodoxy and begin to open up. Take a listen. I think the White House personnel were very focused on this pandemic in March and April. I think once the country began to open and it was clear to me that they weren't going to follow my really gated criteria that I had worked hard on. How to open restaurants, how to let people I combined dine all of that together um, for these great gating criteria. So. In calculating everything with the slow reopening, I didn't think anyone could get to phase three until August. And you can see in the states that followed either that criteria or a similar criteria, that's how long it took them. Yeah, right. I worked so hard, Dr. Jill <laughs> Biden. I worked so hard on the gating criteria to come up with the uh, answer. Uh, you know, me being the Oracle of Delphi, that then should be distributed to all the governors to follow with specificity. This is so interesting because this is the the folly of the expert class, uh, particularly in retrospect. Barton Swain, in an excellent piece in The Wall Street Journal over the weekend about Trump and the failure of said expert class. And on COVID, he wrote in part, We are still in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, so it's difficult to write about it with the perspective it demands. Yet political talking points aside, this much is apparent. No nation or anyhow, no nation that values individual liberty and isn't an island has managed even to slow the spread of COVID-19 without causing economic ruin and attendant disorder. Uh, This is not to say that he has no criticisms of the Trump administration decision-making and communication, he does, and they're, I think, largely on point. 
But he goes on to say the outstanding failure of the 2020 pandemic was the experts belief that only sense the only sensible response involved. Deborah Burks's gating criteria, sustained closures of businesses and schools by any set of criteria outside the self-contained system of public health best practices. The lockdowns failed. They purchased minor slowdowns in the spread of the virus at the cost of punishing economic destruction, untold social dysfunction and mind blowing public debt. The experts failure, but there is no accountability for those failures. There is just the response of, well, they didn't follow the gating criteria. Well, this is a a mutation. Well, we didn't do it big enough. Well, we're not getting enough cooperation. Well, somebody was seen in a position of authority not wearing a mask, and that's what we should all focus on, rather than the underlying policies across the board inflicting exactly what Barton Swaim describes. Dan, the... um... I recommend to everyone who's listening to go back into your bookshelf, find Jonathan Swift, read about the island of Laputa, the floating island, consisting of an educated elite who are fond of mathematics, astronomy, technology, but fail to make practical use of their knowledge. Uh, how, how do you have a, a country that prizes liberty while you're ratcheting down liberty. How do you do that? Given the human failures of, uh, pol- of policymakers like Gavin Newsom, like the, Ms. Burks herself, Dr. Burks herself. There's something else going on here, too, and I think Theodore Dalrymple gets to it in uh, a good piece that he wrote uh, for uh, uh, Law and Liberty, lawliberty.org is the, is the site. Uh, so let's get to Theodore Dalrymple to have him explain. Theodore Dalrymple, contributing editor of City Journal, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and author of False Positive, A Year of Error, Omission, and Political Correctness in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'll start there and then go back and read all of uh, Theodore Dalrymple's oeuvre, I would highly recommend. Uh, Theodore Dalrymple, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for asking me. Um, you um, write in your piece about... Uh, the about pandemic nightmares that um, one of the nightmare or perhaps one of the um, the the bases of the nightmares is this um, this imperative that the state believes it has to appear to be doing something even if it's not doing it and in this case saving lives uh, yes well obviously the uh, politician I for the first time in my life, I have some sympathy for the politicians because they didn't get it in the neck, uh, whatever they do. And uh, they can't be uh, seen to be uh, not doing anything when uh, people are dying. Uh, so uh, they have to do something. And, uh, of course, the, I mean, I live in Europe, and the regulations are different in, uh, in every country in Europe. And... Uh, there isn't really justification uh, for many of them, or at least uh, no public uh, justification of them. Well, but one of the things that uh, some politicians did early and some are doing now is to say, you know, here's what we know and here's what we're trying to figure out. And one of the things that we know is we can't uh, bend nature to our will and we have to try to achieve a balanced approach based on the best, albeit imperfect, information we have. We need to learn to live with this as we've lived with other viral outbreaks in human history. That's what some politicians, a few said, and have been consistent in opposing these strict uh, cookie-cutter lockdowns, while others now who were supporters of those strict cookie-cutter lockdowns, I'm thinking of the governor of New York, the mayor of Chicago— now we're coming around to the reality of the human condition that we do need to learn to live with these things if you want to live in a free society and combat them in a way that uh, takes trade-offs into account. Yes, well, we, the trouble is we, uh, we don't t- uh, take trade-offs I- into account, and the politicians have to look at the uh, headlines and what is being said on social media and so on. So uh, very few politicians who are in power 
uh, have the uh, have at any rate from the beginning said we have to uh, we have to trade off possibly deaths against the economic uh, and social destruction. And no, polit- at least I don't know of any politicians in Europe who have said that. The uh, uh, the nearest who have come to it uh, are the Swedes, and they have in fact had more deaths than their near neighbours. Uh, uh, Denmark, uh, Finland, Norway, which are very comparable countries. Uh, but if, uh, say, a British or a French politician said, well, we have to face the fact that uh, people are going to die, but we can't just close the whole economy down because of that, um, I think there would be a terrible outcry. Well, I mean, you know, just pick pick your outcry, I suppose. I wanted to get to one one other premise uh, here, get your assessment of this, particularly as a psychiatrist. Uh, going back to Barton Swaim's piece in the Wall Street Journal that I was referencing, he writes, Controlling the spread of COVID-19 in the U.S. was always going to be a messy business. Many infected people don't get sick and have no compelling reason to burrow in their homes. And America is an unruly nation with a long tradition of nonconformity. These experts might have accounted for these realities. Part of this is the suspension of disbelief, because not only do these politicians pretend they they can bend nature to its will, that they believe they can change man, change the innate nature of man through state policy. Yes, well, I mean, the fact is, of course, that uh, it was clear from fairly early on that the vast majority of the population had relatively little, but very little really, uh, to fear from this uh, virus. And only certain groups had uh, had something to fear, the, the very old people like me, in fact. So, uh, uh, but they, the politicians felt they couldn't make different policies for different groups of people. I mean, as soon as anyone suggested that there would be a differential between the way, uh, there should be a differential between the way very old people and uh, young people are uh, treated, uh, were immediately accused of uh, trying to institute apartheid, uh, which, of course, is ridiculous uh, because the difference in uh, the suggested way in which people were treated uh, was based on on real evidence and real dangers. Uh, But anyway, that that is just one of the problems that the the politicians face, that... uh, uh, if they suggest such a thing, uh, the specific uh, measures uh, that affect some people much more than others, uh, they're cried down. Uh, Mr. Dyerupple, I'm a big fan, doctor, and uh, I wanted to ask you about the relationship between the fear of COVID and the desire to eliminate risk among many Americans and people of the West. Like, we must not risk one thing, one child, one person's death, and we'll trade our liberties for it. And the 9-11 catastrophe terrorism attacks in uh, New York of years ago, where we eagerly ran to give up our liberty to our central state. Please look at my phone. Please... Uh, watch my every movements. Please read my email. What what has happened to to culture in these? Well, as you as you point out, that uh, people uh, uh, are unwilling to risk anything, and in a way, you can say this is. The, uh, I'm not religious myself, but it's a decline in uh, religious belief. Uh, and if you don't believe in any external meaning to life, then life is all you have, and it must be saved at all costs. So you're, because uh, after life, there's nothing. And uh, and so uh, saving life, especially your own life, but including lives of others, is the uh, main aim of life. The longer the life, the better the life. Uh, but so any yeah. life that is cut that is cut short is a is ipso facto a terrible tragedy. But uh, you write in your piece, though, you know that's sort of um, uh, a self uh, delusion or a rationalization because those lives that uh, uh, the people believe they're saving, either if they're a politician instituting lockdown policies or if they're somebody 
wearing a mask and shaming their neighbors to do the same in their daily lives. Many of them, I mean, they don't really value those lives, those other lives. They, and in point of fact, they support all sorts of policies that devalue uh, those lives, particularly as you go up the age demographic. So, I mean, part of this is all just performance art and not just in the security measures, but in terms of the, the genuine concern for one's fellow man. Yes, well, uh, that is true, but uh, we live in an age, uh, one could say, uh, it's an age of logocracy, and logocracy. Mm -hmm. So what you say is actually the most important aspect of your whole morality. And where that is the case, the the content and the meaning are are relatively unimportant. So we have people uh, who are very uh, virtuous, um, in their words, uh, but do nothing. And, uh, and they are deemed good. Oh, yes. Yes, no, there's no question about that. Um, you, 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 uh, again, leaning on your per, uh, expertise uh, in medicine as a psychiatrist, uh, stories out uh, the last week or so about school districts that are reopening in part because they're finally starting to get um, the message about how uh, destructive keeping kids in relative isolation has been both in terms of mental health as well as in terms of the worst outcomes, meaning suicides, not to mention the, uh, the, the, the spike in uh, opioid overdose deaths around the country, again, headlines over the last several weeks. And I, I wonder how long you think that the tale might be with respect to the psychology of, of young people in particular, sort of of school age and of, of, the culture in general, how, how long uh, the um, uh, the safetyism and the, the 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 people who are sort of addled by fear will last? It has this this a- episode over the last year and and ongoing, you know, fundamentally altered the course of Western civilization for some time to come? Well, I I can't quite make up my mind about this because, of course, people are capable of amnesia is a great force. So people are capable of uh, forgetting things very quickly. And if you talk to the young in, uh, in uh, or people who lived through 10 or 15 years of communism, they've forgotten about it already, and no one tells them about it. Um, and the safetyism that you refer to, I mean, this is an extreme form of the safetyism there is, but there is uh, there's a safetyism uh, that preceded this. This just doesn't come out of nothing. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I once counted on an escalator in Sydney, Australia, uh, six warnings about how to go up an escalator <laughs> safely. <laughs> yes. And unfortunately, they were all at the bottom, so I nearly fell off while I was trying to do that. <laughs> well, thank God you survived that escalator ride. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was terribly dangerous. You know? <laughs> there were people being made mincemeat of by this escalator. But luckily, <laughs> luckily, some were saved by these notices. But anyway, the point is that uh, uh, there, there are hundreds of notices all over the place. I mean, uh, you would think that going on a bus was incredibly dangerous from the notices on, on buses now and so on and so forth. And uh, please leave this read the safety instructions on trains and that kind of thing. Those messages we get. And on trains, please, please um, report if you see anything suspicious. Well, to me, most of the people on the train. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh... So, I mean, so, so we live in an age in which uh, people are supposed to be uh, extremely... Uh, uh, safety conscious, although, of course, they are safer than any human beings have ever been in the whole of human history. Um, but Except I suppose when they sit the down world... to write. Except when they sit down to write. Right? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, uh, I suppose uh, uh, fears grow. Uh, I mean, fear is inverse proportion, inversely proportional to its real causes or reason for fear. All right, I'm going to leave. Uh, it with that. I'm going to call that the Del Ripple equation. Uh, yeah, I, I like that. Uh, Theodore Del Ripple, contributing editor, City Journal, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and author of. 
false positive, a year of error, omission, and political correctness in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Dow Ripple, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank Take care. Bye. It's a great pleasure, Doctor. Yeah, I love the, the dry wit, as only the British can do. And he joined us on the turnkey.pro answer line. Before you see it on TV, share it on Facebook or read about it in the paper. Hear it here first. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560. The Answer. This holiday season, did you visit your crawl space to retrieve the Christmas tree and decorations? Are you one who wouldn't venture down there on a bet? Hi, I'm Roy Spencer from Permaseal, and if you're one of the latter, I can't blame you. We've seen some pretty nasty crawl spaces full of mold, mildew, and crawly things. Certainly not a place to store your family treasures. Well, this year, let Permaseal wrap your crawl space up in our clean space encapsulation system. Clean Space will transform your dirty, dark crawl space into a bright, clean, valuable storage area where you can confidently